African Union leaders met with their counterparts in Brussels for the sixth AU-EU summit to reboot and deepen ties. It comes amid tensions over COVID vaccines, migration and trade. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen calls it a partnership of equals. But is it really? Many in Africa may disagree with that as we look at just how lopsided this partnership is. Amid the smiles, it's been a complicated relationship. Much is made of Europe being Africa's largest trading partner and investor, but Africa now has others it can turn to for better and fairer agreements. Europe is concerned about these African partnerships, particularly with China, but some of Europe's own policies are causing harm in Africa. For example, 54% of the continent's workforce relies on agriculture, but imports from abroad pose a major threat. Staple foods like rice, sugar and wheat from Europe retail cheaper here in Nairobi as compared to the local produce, and that's because our farmers are not as heavily subsidized as their counterparts in Europe, and therefore they cannot compete. A kilo of wheat from Europe retails at 20% cheaper than that which is locally produced. I prefer the one from Europe due to its pricing. I cannot buy at $1.58 while the one from Europe retails at 90 cents. Now, the influx of these agricultural products from Europe has led to the closure of farms and companies, leading to loss of jobs and, as a result, high unemployment levels among East Kenyans. With high unemployment, many Africans migrate in search of a better life. 80% of this movement is within the continent. But some of those who want to go to Europe have taken dangerous journeys across land and sea. The EU is spending millions of euros to limit migrant numbers, but critics say it could do more to address the root causes of this migration, which include poor governance. Sahel has seen four successful coups in the last one year. Now that's the result of people's growing frustration over poor leadership, poverty and insecurity. EU forces led by France have worked together with regional troops for the past 10 years to end Islamic insurgency. But their efforts so far have been unproductive and many people in Mali, for example, are not happy with France. They believe the relationship has mostly been one-sided. Economic benefits for the former colonizer, but not much for West Africa. <laughs> The international community should let the transition government do its job. We need the international community to extend its support so that we get out of this crisis. To get Mali out of this mess, its poor economy and insecurity, we need France to leave this country. European militaries, including France and Denmark, are now withdrawing soldiers from West Africa. This could signal a reset of the long relationship with less focus on military or security aspects. If anything has recently exposed the true state of affairs between Europe and Africa, it's been the COVID-19 pandemic. As wealthier nations scooped up the world's vaccine supply, Africa was sidelined. To date, only 11% of people on the continent are fully vaccinated. As if that was not enough, the emergence of new variants of the coronavirus led many European countries to swiftly ban travel from Africa, except that those measures were not applied to wealthier nations where the variants were also found. Many South Africans were furious about the measures introduced. Travel bans and flight restrictions once again had a devastating impact on the economy here. And scientists in South Africa said they're basically being punished for the good work they're doing. And some even openly asked if other countries would have implemented the same measures if Omicron was detected outside Africa. Local vaccine production is the latest bone of contention. South Africa has been asking for an intellectual property right waiver in order to produce mRNA vaccines here on the continent, something that Germany in particular has been opposing. One key feature in the relationship between the two sides has been aid. The EU channels nearly 20 billion euros to Africa every year. This system is helping many African governments stay afloat but critics say it also keeps the recipients perpetually dependent on these handouts. 
So it's clear that both sides need to review and revamp the terms of their dealings to be able to achieve that equal partnership they speak of. The African Union chairman, Macky Sall, said their summit was a way to, quote, achieve a renewed, modernized and more action-oriented partnership. For France's president, Emmanuel Macron, it was a chance to prove why Europe should be Africa's most reliable partner. My colleague, Christine Mundua, followed the summit and tells us more. So 40 delegations from Africa traveled to the European capital, Brussels, for this summit, and there were high expectations coming in. Not all of them were met, but there were some significant developments. Chief among them is that there is going to be the transfer of mRNA technology to six African countries, which will effectively uh, see the manufacturing of vaccines on the continent. Beyond addressing the vaccine inequity on the uh, continent right now, this is also going to... Uh, be developed to combat other diseases like malaria and eventually cancer down the line. So this is a significant uh, development, although many African heads of state are still calling for the lifting of those patents to be able to make vaccines on their own using their own pharmaceutical capacities. They was also, uh, there was also the big announcement of uh, the European Union's investment uh, onto the continent under the name of the Global Gateway Scheme. This is basically Europe's answer to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Much of this money is going to be committed to infrastructure projects across the continent. Now, this uh, summit was supposed to take place in 2020. It was pushed back because of the pandemic. And in that time, we've really seen relations between the two geopolitical neighbors sour to an extent very emotional language. You've heard about vaccine apartheid, among other things, as African leaders felt that their European counterparts left them out in the cold in the pandemic. So it was important that they could meet face to face, that they could discuss certain issues uh, and make some progress, as some delegates were telling us um, as the meetings were going along. So they all head back now to their capital. Some have had successful bilateral meetings where they've struck up even more deals and this is what makes a summit like this even more important because it does boost someone's profile on the domestic stage but overall uh, that relationship between Europe and Africa on the question that we're asking is it an equal partnership a partnership of equals well we're not quite Uhuru just yet, right? But I think the fact that you've had such uptake and interest in the summit, uh, willingness to cooperate, engage, is, is a positive sign. And of course, time will tell if things are eventually getting better in that sense. You're watching DW News Africa still to come. How artists from Ghana and Spain are reaping the benefits of collaboration just another example of what an equal partnership between Africa and Europe can be like. But is the AU-EU partnership a genuine relationship of equals? We'll hear from a member of the European Parliament who believes that has never been the case. The European countries have always been uh, babysitting uh, Africa. One area where the balance of power between Africa and Europe is one-sided is when it comes to trade. African nations generally struggle to compete on the international market. In Ghana, for example, the local tomato industry is under serious threat. Increasing imports of tomato products from abroad are driving many farmers out of business. Benedicta Afrifa is a tomato farmer in the middle of one of Ghana's main production regions. In the past, this was like harvesting red gold. Instead, farmers like her have fallen on tough times. We have a lot of problems, which makes it hard to survive in this country. The biggest challenge is imported tomatoes. After independence, Ghana introduced customs duties to make imports more expensive. That protected local producers like Benedicta. Then Ghana joined the World Trade Organization and lowered customs duties to do so. Now it's being flooded with cheap foreign products. So when Benedicta heads to market, she's forced to sell at rock-bottom prices. I asked for 320 CDs. They offered 270 and said others are giving even less. At this price, I won't earn anything. Almost half of household spending on vegetables in Ghana goes on tomatoes. The middle classes especially like theirs canned. With the right investment, 
Many believe Ghana could meet some of that demand by itself. I'll be very happy if we have a company here in Ghana that we produce our own tomatoes. We can them instead of people going to import it. Economist Kwabeno Otu says that free trade has not just hurt local farmers, it's also opened the door to poorer quality. So this one is from China. Only 30% tomato, about 70% starch. We do not have the capacity to change these things because we have lost control of our policy. The Rwanda banned the import of second-hand clothing from the U.S. and the U.S. kicked them out of the African Growth and Opportunities Act. So that is how vicious the response can be if you try to change policy to favor your own people. Free trade should not destroy livelihoods. It does make me sad, sometimes to the point of anger, because those who profit are very few. The losers are many. And right now, their numbers are growing. As African and European leaders talk about strengthening economic ties, many on the continent wonder when, if they will ever, see the rewards of that partnership. Let's talk more about the relationship between Europe and Africa with Asita Kanko. She is a member of the European Parliament and joins us from Strasbourg. Hello, Asita. Now, as leaders from Europe and Africa gathered for this uh, sixth edition of the EU-AU summit, uh, we were hearing about partnership. But is it a true partnership of equals, you think? Of course not. It has actually never been a partnership of of equals because uh, the European countries have always been uh, babysitting uh, Africa and uh, they have never seen Africa as an adult uh, area. They have never seen African countries as uh, diverse uh, places. And so this is very disturbing. So this is what I call a nanny diplomacy and it's still going on. So in my opinion, and it's also based on facts, uh, Europe is 60 years late in Africa and is currently sleepwalking. It's a real zombie in Africa. When we see reality, we are not really believing it. And I don't expect very much um, to come out of, of this EU-Africa summit that has been postponed several times because this relationship is not being taken seriously. These are very strong words from you. If you're saying it's not a partnership of equals, how can it then be a partnership of equals? What, what can be done to achieve that? I think the first thing that we need to do is to stop with the dead aid. You know, because this aid is just contributing to finance corruption and it's going into the wrong pockets. It's contributing to sustain dictatorship. And we have noticed so many times that it has not helped improve anything. Look at the situation in Africa. It's easy. We need to count. We can count how much money has been flowing, and we can look at how much improvement has been made. And, and then we can see the hard facts. Today, even uh, France is running away from Mali after having pumped so much money. They did not succeed to stop Islamism there. They did not succeed to, uh, to build a, a real uh, g good governance. They only succeeded to uh, help the elite continue to misuse funds, and they have succeeded to open the door for Russian mercenaries. So they should, nobody should be proud of how things are going. So I believe this must change. Okay. So you actually mentioned um, France uh, planning to um, withdraw its troops from Mali. Uh, there are a number of security issues in Africa right now, especially across the Sahel. Russia is also trying to tackle the problem. So why does Europe have a problem with that? Well, I, of course, I have a problem with Russia because it's not, uh, it's not, uh, Russia is not an, an example of democracy. You need to look at how Putin is treating his opponents, huh? uh, you know, with poison and sending them almost to death, uh, and some even died in prison. This is really actually what we do not want to keep in Africa. So if Russia has to pretend to bring democracy in any African country, seriously, um, anyone who has a little common sense should never believe in that. 
So I mean, you know, if you go to the dentist and the dentist's teeth are very ugly, so why would you believe that he will help you have beautiful teeth? It's, it's, just, it's just obvious that Russia is not an example of democracy and an example of security for anyone. And, you know, we didn't see many Africans running away to migrate to Russia. Did you ever see in the news that plenty of Africans running away from economic and, uh, and crisis and security crisis and trying to go to Russia so that they can be safe and healthy and rich? No, they are running away to the West. They are running away to Europe. They don't go to Iran. They don't go to Saudi Arabia. They don't go to Russia. And that is enough evidence. What is being attacked in, uh, in West Africa, for example, now in the Sahel, Mali, Burkina Faso, etc., is what we know as Western civilization. It is what we know as Western values. It is what we are defending as democratic values. And this is mm. under attack, not only by the jihadists, but also by Russia. And on anything related to human rights, of course, China doesn't care. So what we are doing is not working. We need to make sure that our companies, businesses can work with the businesses there. We need to make sure that if we actually put money somewhere that we know where the money is going, that we, we know that we're not complicit of building more dictatorship and more problems. This aid okay. is killing Africa. Uh, Europe wants to be Africa's first choice for economic partnership, but China appears to be the favored option in Africa. Is Europe willing to offer a better deal than China? Look, I think it's... Um, the, the point is that the relationship between EU, Europe and Africa should be unique. You know, it has nothing to do with whatever China is doing in Africa. Europe must know what Europe's needs are, because in a partnership or in any relationship, even between two human beings, it's about mutual needs as well. So what does Europe want to get out of this relationship? Why does Europe even need to have a serious relationship with Africa? And this is based on that, that the relationship should be built. Because we don't need the same things as China or Russia. But we can have a mutual partnership where it is a win-win situation for both African countries and European countries. Geographically, we are also quite close. Uh, we speak the same languages as well, uh, French, English, etc. So I believe that this is where we need to start. Because Europe has an approach and a mindset that is of the 60s. So we need to travel in time and, and come in this, in this century. So with this mindset, Europe is starting somewhere where everything is wrong already, like we need to help Africa. But why don't we start like, this is what we need, and Africa can actually be a partner for us to achieve that, and what is in it for them, and really start this way. I think that would be a good way to start. And when things are going wrong, stop and say, look, we are not doing qu quite well. What, uh, we need to stop here and admit that we made a mistake and see how we can improve things. But that's not what is happening right now, unfortunately. And I think that the Euro European countries who continue to sustain that old-fashioned way of having relations with Africa are actually guilty of racism. This is the racism that the left is never speaking about. It is a huge international way of doing that is looking at African people like people who are less than other people in the world. And I think this is really heartbreaking. Wow, oh, it definitely sounds heartbreaking, especially from, from how you put it. Uh, you earlier mentioned the issue of migration. It clearly is still a, pr a big problem for Europeans. Th there are people who genuinely deserve asylum, but it appears Europe is doing more to keep people mm -hmm. out rather than create safe and legal passages for people to migrate. Why is that? Look, I am going to say something here that maybe people don't know, but being a member of the European Parliament for more than two years now, working in the Libya Committee that is mainly dealing with security, migration and fundamental rights, I can tell you that Europe is doing absolutely nothing about migration policy. Europe is talking, 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 but doing absolutely nothing. So what is happening is that people are still dying in the sea. What is happening is that Europe comes with proposals. It was like in 2020, and until now, nothing happened with these proposals. And Europe came back, uh, the France came a couple of weeks ago with new ideas. So what they do is that to sleep like during one year and then come up with new proposals and then come, it's like bringing just the same wine in a new bottle. That is exactly what is happening. But nothing concrete is happening. And that is the problem. Because if not, nothing is happening, who is actually leading the migration policy? It is the human smugglers. And you know what they are doing? They are trafficking women, forcing them into prostitution. They are taking money from people selling 
uh, lies and, and false hope and having them go and die in the sea. And this is, what is, this is what we need to stop by having an actual migration policy. And what would that migration policy do? First of all, stop the human smugglers by making sure that it's, it becomes impossible to put people in a boat to go in the deadly uh, sea. That is one thing. Second, to have a global partnership with Africa that will develop also economically so that young people don't need to run away from their homes. To have a security, a common security strategy that actually works, that people are not displaced. So it's a, a holistic approach that we need to have and we need to have the humility to admit that nothing is happening. Even Commission President von der Leyen admitted that during her State of the Union speech, that we didn't move forward. So I was born and I grew up in Africa, in Burkina Faso. What I've seen as a child and as a teenager is Europe Come, European leaders coming with uh, checks and saying on television, look, we are bringing this money into Africa and things are going to be resolved. We're watching the news and knowing nothing is going to change in our lives. Today, I'm a European leader myself as well, and I see uh, European leaders going to Africa and doing the exact same scenario. But what happens when you keep doing what you have always done? You just get what you have always gotten. Asita Kanko. Thank you very much for your time. Now, what can art teach politics? Well, a group of urban painters from Africa and Europe might have the answer. In 2021, they collaborated on a series of stunning murals in Ethiopia. Ghanaian artist Mohamed Awudu paints pictures of everyday life and ordinary people and the issues that affect them. So I use uh, those murals and, and graffiti as a tool to change perception and educate people about what is going on, things that are not um, uh, right here in the community, education, female, uh, uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, gender issues and uh, problems of migration. Awudu has become one of Ghana's most sought after artists traveling the globe and collaborating with other artists. Black, white, we are one people. One so we just go like this, bro. Be sad, man. Last year, he and other artists were invited to work at the EU's office in Ethiopia's capital Addis Ababa. Awodu says that as much as he enjoyed working together, it also made him realize how African artists are at a disadvantage. They have all the support. They have artists fund when you want to go to residency, when you want to go to a festival in another country. There are institutions that will fund you fully to go and study and do projects. But in Africa, trust me, or here in Ghana, there's no fund, there's no support. So, but if we put all these uh, uh, things in place, trust me, uh, we're going to uh, bridge the gap. We're going to uh, make a better collaboration. Maria Penakoto worked with Mohamed Awudu on the Addis Ababa project. She is a multidisciplinary Spanish artist whose paintings have won many awards. She says the collaborative work with African artists has been impactful. See, to be there also and to see uh, how great is the is the art that they are developing, it's very inspiring. And also in this case, I would do, he's uh, much more, he has much more experience than me. Uh, so I was learning a lot from him. He and, and the other artists were explaining me some techniques that now I'm using in my work. He works more with spray. I work more with brass. So we were sharing uh, um, our experience, no? Mm. And uh, yeah, it was really enriching. Mohamed Awudu's artworks are popular and can be seen all over Accra. With more support, he would love to mentor younger upcoming artists in his communities. And that's it from our focus on AU-EU relations. Bye for now.